Mother Teresa says that not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. My guest today is doing many things with great love by transforming lives. She started with eight street children, which grew to hundreds more in the last 16 years. Together with her husband, she helps vulnerable street children by offering education, counseling, and nutrition. Earlier this year, she received the prestigious Points of Light Award awarded by the late Queen Elizabeth II. Hello and welcome to Season 5 of the Women Printed Asia podcast and I'm your host, Krista Good. My mission is to uncover the stories and strategies of Asian women entrepreneurs in Asia to help you as you navigate your own business journey. This episode is brought to you by Redbox Studio. If you want to be kept updated on new episodes, join my email list that you can find on womenpreneurasia.com. Today's episode is with a founding director of a non-profit from Sri Lanka, Debbie Edrissing Hay. Debbie is the founding director of Child Action Lanka, a non-profit organization with a team of 110 volunteers across Sri Lanka. Her organization, Child Action Lanka, offers housing and food, schooling and educational resources, as well as counseling to ensure lower school dropout rates. In our conversation today, Debbie spoke about the need to give children a second chance and to transform their lives. In our heartwarming interview, she spoke about the lessons she had learned over the years in running a non-profit and her leadership style. Despite what has happened in Sri Lanka this year, she's even more determined to help the children whose lives are the most affected. She talks about making a difference through her work with women and children through various initiatives, but what strikes me most is that she reminds her own daughters that she is raising them to be strong women. You will love today's episode. Hello, Debbie. Welcome to Women Printer Asia. Hi, Krista. Really nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Debbie, where are you today? I'm in Colombo, in Sri Lanka. Life is very interesting in Sri Lanka right now. I think Lanka has probably hit world news on many fronts, so I can't call it bored. I can't call myself being bored in any sense. There's a lot going on. I wouldn't say it's all like amazing news, but I would say it's a very adventurous time. You think in terms of economics, in terms of politics, in terms of development, in in terms of everything going on. I would say it's a very adventurous time and a time that we've been called to think outside the box. And you have been thinking outside the box for a number of years. (laughs) Yeah, I think I'm known to be doing that a lot. And I like thinking outside the box, not being very traditional in my thinking, I'd say. What is it that you do, Debbie? And how are you thinking outside the box? Yeah, one of the things I do in terms of thinking outside the box is having started an organization for street-connected children. Uh, I look at how to provide them with education, with health care, with nutrition, with child protection, and how to make these developments sustainable for them through the organization that I run that is called Child Action Lanka. And I think that's that's been one of the big thinking outside the box initiatives that I've done in terms of creating a model to break the cycle of poverty for these children. And what compelled you to do that, Debbie? Because that is a really, it's, it's a big area of work, right? Yeah, it's a... I think it's, that's a very good question, Krista, but I think it's also been that that passion inside to want to help transform the lives of children. And I think I realized that very early on that we can't do a lot of things, but I think it's Mother Teresa who said, but we can do a few things, a little things with a lot of love and bring that kind of change into the world. And I realized that when it comes to children, they don't have a lot of big expectations. I think as we grow older as adults, we grow up with our expectations grow as well. But when it comes to children, they're looking at very little things. And if we can make those little things happen, and there's a huge community of these children who don't have those little expectations being met for them. You know, it might be just a cup of milk. It might be just a plate of food for them. It might be just clothes to wear. Can I go to school? Can I have a roof above my above my head? So little things like that, they're not looking for, can I have the next big luxurious house or I need to get the next iPhone or I need to get... Those are not their dreams and they have little things. And 
having my own kids and being able to provide for them i just realized that there's a whole lot of kids out there who don't have these things being met for them and i think that is what kind of drove me to want to bring that kind of change and i realized that providing these little things can bring a huge transformation into their lives and that's what kind of triggered it and has fueled the passion right through my journey to date if you could take us back to the very beginning what was that like where do you start a lot of people say that they had a huge vision and a huge dream to start an organization like this and so that they went into it and that's how they ended up starting my story is quite different i didn't have a plan to start an organization i wasn't planning on creating a ngo what of what we have today i wasn't planning on working with kids of children It was not on the plan at all. What happened was that I worked for a development organization before this where I got exposed to development work. My background was in business. So it was quite interesting actually getting into the development field and suddenly my eyes were open into seeing oh my goodness, you know, there's so much of work to be done and there's so much need out there. I'm not even talking about wants, but I'm just talking about basic needs out there that need to be met. and that there was so much for us to do and so that's where i got exposed to that whole field and then i had i met a friend who was running an, a, a small organization she was a teacher and she was busy teaching english to a few, about eight street connected children and i went alongside and asked her what is it that we can do to support what you what you're doing because i think what you're doing is absolutely amazing and then i spoke to the organization i was working with to see how could we possibly support what is it that we could be doing and i was trying to join the dots between the organization i worked and the work that this lady was doing as an individual and that's when she said i'm thinking of leaving the country soon and i don't know what to do with these children but if that's something that you would like to maybe working with these children is something you can take on and i think that rocked my boat a bit because i was very comfortable very happy i had the 9 to 5 job i could go home and sleep in the nights in peace and not have to think about anything so i said oh, i don't think that's for me because i was quite content the way i was and then she said well if it is something do let me know but that's a huge need and it was a long story from there but we ended up taking on from her taking on these eight children my husband and myself and i'm really grateful that i've got a very supportive husband who said let's do this and so we started out there we took on these eight children didn't quite know what we were getting ourselves into because we didn't have kids at that point either we had two people who were already working with these children but suddenly what happened is we lost the place when this lady handed over the project to us we lost the place that we were running it in because they didn't know us and they didn't quite want to give it to us and so we unknowingly brought it into the center of where all the street children were and suddenly these eight children expanded to 30 children and became 50 children became 80 children and the two people who were helping out in the project it was a bit overwhelming for them because they didn't know what to do with so many kids neither did we so i think it was a huge learning curve and we all put ourselves as students out there trying to figure out what we did, what we could do and that's where it all started out and um i think it's been a incredible journey so today we've expanded into other areas but it, it wasn't one of those big organizations that we had a big strategic plan to start with then this is how we're going to reach the nation yes we are across the island of sri lanka we were in many many districts and many provinces but it was never on the cards i think it's an organization that we've grown quite organically and it's been an amazing journey of seeing the lives of these children being transformed and what were the original eight children i'm sure they've grown up right 
Yes, they have. They used to be children who were begging on the streets. Their parents begged on the streets and they basically lived on the streets. Today, they're not on the streets anymore. They've gone on to have their own businesses. They've gone on to build their own houses. They've gone overseas for employment. They've gone on to become professionals in many fields. And I think that's been a huge sense of reward in a certain sense. Not that we do it expecting that reward, but just seeing that something that being able to contribute, I think, in a very small way to see that change happen in their life has been amazing. So these children, I think, in a certain sense, who spent their life being born on the streets, having lived on the street, being destined to continue being on the streets, for them, their life being completely transformed, having gone on to living life completely different, being able to contribute to society, being responsible citizens, in the country, giving back to giving back to society is a huge factor of where you see so much joy in it, in a certain sense. And you've become like the mother hen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it often feels like that because they keep coming back. Them, I think our centers are often their safe place. That's their safe house. That's where they feel like they belong to that one place where they feel they belong to, where they know they are respected and treated well, where they're loved and cared. And though the program runs for 18 years for them, like up to the age of 18, which we have now expanded also to 18 plus. And though we say, okay, the program's over, it never ends there because they keep coming back. And we keep them from there onwards, helping them with their jobs, helping them with their weddings, children. So I think, yeah, in a certain sense, it's being a big mother here now. <laughs> and when you started, you mentioned that your husband was very supportive, which is yeah. great because it always is better if you have a partner yeah. who understands. Mm. And now you just mentioned that you have children of your own. And how old are your children? So I've got two girls. One is nine and one is 15. Um, and how do your children take in the fact that their parents are working with this organization, lots of kids, lots of people around them all the time? I think... Quite honestly, it's been, it's hard for them because it's not a normal parent coming back home and saying, I'm here for you. But it's more like having to share their parents with hundreds and hundreds of other children and knowing that sometimes, okay, my mom's going to have to rush from parents meeting here to go and see to another child who's maybe in hospital or in courts or in police or whatever. And constantly... There's only two of them at home, but knowing that they have to share their life, their family, their environment with hundreds of other kids, I wouldn't want to lie and say that it's be it's amazing and that they love that fact. I think that's something that they also have their own struggles about it, but they also do understand the importance of it and the life-changing moments it creates for others. I have to be very grateful to them for, in some sense, coping maybe with it. But on the other hand, also being very understanding because the work that I do then takes me overseas a lot, takes me away from them a lot to have to release and things like that. And so they've got to sometimes cope. And at one point, I remember having this chat with my older daughter and I said, she said, other kids, their parents, their moms are there to do homework with them and all these, feed them and all these things. And I said, I'm in the process of raising strong women. I want my two daughters to be strong women. And what you can't do, I will do with you, for you and teach you how. But the things that you can do, I want to empower you to do better and so I've heard them quote it a few times now and I think it's kind of in there somewhere that they know they're being raised as strong women to face society. I love that message. I think instead of you trying to put on a brave face or trying to tell them it's okay, you are actually showing them realistically that this is the work that you've got to do. And at the same time, that's how they should also empower themselves when you're not around to help them <laughs> yeah, to no, enable they are. them. Yeah, they are. I'm really happy. They've grown up quite 
independent and they have they support each other and there's the fact that they can't manage it thank god we've got like all whatsapps and all these things that they can always contact and there there are the moments that they might be like mommy <laughs> but uh, apart from that i'm really proud of the fact that they are able to handle a lot of things that children their age would be struggling with would normally the other classmates and friends would have would find hard but they're able to handle those things and they're able to think through they're able to rationalize and i hope it continues that way that is good to know because in a way you're raising the next generation yes next generation <laughs> women leaders eh <laughs> yeah. yeah so let's talk a little bit about child action lanka and what are some of the programs that you are running because i do know and i saw that the recent project that you have is cups of milk So right now I think it's hit even the public I have seen loads of advertisements from the UN especially UNICEF and all these people talking about the levels of malnutrition in the country due to the low economic conditions that we're facing due to a lot of other factors and so because of that there are also there's also the point where kids are unable to go to school because they're hungry they don't have food the numbers of children attending school have dropped drastically at least by 50% is what some of the principals told us and as part of what we can do to contribute we do run our centers across the country and we do have nutrition programs where we feed children but we are not registered schools we provide support to education and so because of that what we did is we stepped out there to start this project called cup of milk and uh, the cup of milk project is actually where our, our volunteers and our staff going to schools that are given to us by the education department saying these are really rural schools really poor schools where kids are struggling to meet their basic needs in terms of nutrition and what we've done is we go in there with hot cups of milk to give the kids to drink and because of there's import restrictions in the country and because the prices have gone up so much these are children whose parents work on daily labor so them being able to afford a cup of milk is quite a luxury for them and for us what we've done is we're reaching out to the public right now saying this is what we want to do so we've currently gone for a phase of we want to give out 10000 cups of milk and every child gets a cup of milk once a week we've so far come to a little over 4000 but we we're heading towards 10,000 and then we want to go for the other districts as well to be able to reach other areas in the country and the request for milk has been pouring in we've got schools principals saying could you please come to our school could you please help with our children our children need milk too and that's why we've been doing a lot of publicity on it to see if the general public would be interested in joining in to see if they would want to contribute to this or even come and join us with volunteering being part of the team of serving milk around and because of this we've also heard that kids have started coming back to school one of the principals i think there's a video coming out quite soon of a principal talking about how it's improved the attendance of children in his school because children find it hard to come that far they have to walk sometimes because of the fuel crisis bus fares are too high for them and this cup of milk has become an incentive for them to want to come to school it's almost like getting gold in the in times like this in the country right now so it's been a an interesting initiative one of those things that i think we started it very small not thinking it was going to become such a huge need but it's been quite mind blowing to see how much the need for it has risen we've not been able to still give them plate of rice or a full meal or something we're just giving cups of milk and that in itself has created such a huge demand of people just rising out there and saying can you bring it to our school as well the response from schools have been overwhelming what about the response from the public or the people out there how do they respond to that cup of milk project we've got quite a few people who've come on board and said you know i'd like to donate and all they're saying is one dollar can give three cups of milk and so i feel like 
There's a lot of people who have come forward and said individuals who donated maybe five dollars, ten dollars, twenty dollars, saying I want to help with this project. But I would wish is that there were more. We have had a few corporates join in as well, but I would like to see more corporates coming and getting involved and saying we can give for another hundred, hundred thousand cups or whatever. So that we can take it out to other parts of the country. Yeah, that is a very useful initiative because at one end you're giving them an incentive to come back to school. Exactly. So I think even school principals are really craving for this kind of service because it's helping them bring kids back to school, especially after after the whole COVID thing where children stayed away from school for the last two years. And then we had this whole fuel crisis, so there were no buses, and kids couldn't go to school. So schools closed down. So schools have been closed in the country for at least two and a half years, on and off. And then ad hoc basis they open, then try to start things, restart even. And so children have got, in a certain sense, got used to not going to school. And a lot of the bigger kids from grade nine, ten, this group have ended up going out and getting jobs to support their families, and that's only going to increase the level of unskilled labour for the future workforce. And that's not what we need. We need to be able to break this cycle of poverty. Kids need to be able to finish their basic education. I'm not talking of getting their masters or their PhDs or whatever. I'm just saying finish a basic education. And if we can support to make that happen, yeah, I'm more than happy to be able to support that. And how do you come up with the idea? So it, I can't even take credit for the idea. The idea actually belonged to the guys who do our social media. So there's a company that we outsource our social media and the head of that organization He's very passionate about what we do, and sometimes I think he also refuels some of the passion. That when I'm having a really tough day, I might have a chat with him, and he's, "No, Debbie, we've got to do this, and we've got to do that." He's one of those kind of people, and so he's the one who kind of said, "I've got an idea. How about we do a project uh, serving a cup of milk?" And he had said this quite a while back. And I was always like, "Yeah, it's a good idea. Let's do it." And we kept on postponing it because when you're working with children, you're constantly also firefighting on many fronts because you're dealing with lives that are struggling and lives that have got so much pressure going on. And so, because of that, in a certain sense, starting new projects takes a backseat sometimes. So this is one of those things that I've taken a backseat for, for quite a while. I think at least about a year and a half. When he kept pushing, saying, "When are we going to do this cup of milk? When are we going to do it?" And also for us as an organization, we had to step out there and use some of the general funding we got that we could be using at our centers to say, "Okay, we're going to start it by putting our general fund in there and buying the milk, giving it to kids, hoping others will join us on this journey." And I think he kept pushing for it so much that eventually. I just needed to give in and go. Okay, we're going to start this. <laughs> so that's where it started out, and I've thanked him many times, actually saying thanks so much for thinking. And he's just—he's not even a development person. He's—he's he's an IT person. He's a social media marketing person, and he was thinking, how can we serve children, not just children who are at our center? So it's easy for us to. Our child action Lanka centers that are around the country. We have child development centers, and at these centers, it's easy for us to take care of kids because they come to us. We provide them with healthcare. We provide them with nutrition. We do breakfast. We do cook meals for them. We do a meal for them to take back with them if they need. So that's not hard. But he said we need to go beyond that. We need to reach out to children who are unable to come to our centers, children who live too far away from our centers. As an organization, we need to be out there caring for children who don't have their basic needs met. And for me, that was like a huge, I think, a huge factor that contributed to wanting to make the project happen. Because I felt, okay, we're doing all we can for children who are able to reach us. But what about those children in the rural areas who are unable to reach us? Can we reach out to them? Can we bring out the fact that we really want to care for them as well? And so that's where the whole, the heart of the milk project started out. 
with wanting to care for children who not just at child action anka centers but just children who needed that level of care who needed their basic needs met we're going to go out to them yeah that's how it all started out so is this one of those projects where you were doing the reach out because you mentioned just now that most of the kids come to your child action lanka centers to get their food and also to get whatever that they need from child action lanka so other than this project in the past were there any projects of such magnitude We have run a few projects like that. So even during COVID times, we took out the packs of dry rations for families, reaching out to them because there were many families who were struggling. Of course, our Child Action Lanka community, the families in them, we definitely made sure that we were able to give them dry rations and we were able to provide them with meals, even when they couldn't come out due to lockdowns and they were struggling because they had no income and no support. So we were able to do that and we gave out thousands and thousands of packs. But apart from that, we were also able to take packs of food and dry ration to communities that were in much need that didn't belong to our centers, but they were just really poor. There was huge needs put out there saying from you know secretary officers, from district officers saying there are need there are needy communities out there. in need of food i remember even in december we took out like 3000 kilos of food and started distributing them and actually the team was very very focused on it wanting to just make it happen that they actually covered that whole thing we covered the whole northern province in a matter of 24 hours they packed overnight they stayed up all night making packet packs and um putting them into lorries and early morning 2 o'clock 3 o'clock in the morning they took them out by 6 7 o'clock in the morning they were in those areas distributing it to families so yeah we've done it and i i get the feeling that i'm in pretty good at doing sudden surges of hundreds and hundreds of communities just reaching out to them and taking support to them yeah so the work that you do really seems to cover the entire sri lanka Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Because yeah, you're in think, so many places and districts. Yeah, we are. So we are right now in five of the nine provinces and we plan on covering the other nine other four provinces in the next 4 to 5 years. But we are currently in the north, in the south, east, west, in the central area. So yeah, we do cover quite a part of the country. But I would say there's a lot of organizations here that are helping with meeting human need because the need is such and i think in the next few months we're going to see that need increasing in the country because of the situation that you know as an economy that we face here and so it's the poor of the poorest that are going to hit get hit even harder i think the middle class they might have to reduce their level of standards of living maybe the others who can manage leaving the country or if not if they are able to survive with the current crisis they are doing that but it's the very poor people who are unable to go who can't leave the country who can't earn more who are going to be struggling and so i can see that need escalating and so i do hope we can continue to do what we're doing but i'm also really grateful to the other organizations in the country that are doing all the humanitarian work right now So you had a long journey with Child Action Lanka. What are some of the top lessons that you've learned from running an organization that does so much of outreach work and helping street children as well as women? I think we mentioned this before we started recording is that not only children but also women. So although we have spoken a lot about children <laughs> but there's so much that we haven't talked about yet also about the women and so what are the lessons for you i think one of the big lessons is that we can't do this alone we need to partner up with other organizations and one of the things that i'm right now really looking for is partnering up with other organizations that are doing similar work so that we are stronger together because very often as ngos we like to work on our own we have our own territories that we mark out and our own work that we cut out and we start doing our own thing but we're much stronger if we work together and we can do so much more 
So I think always looking for those partnerships and collaborations is something that I've learned over the years. I think I probably started out also thinking, oh, we can do this. I can do this. But now over the years, I've learned it's not me. I think we need a we. So that's one of the big lessons. Secondly, I've also learned that you need to constantly be very flexible, very agile um, in terms of how you work because you're not dealing with products here. You're dealing with people. You're dealing with the lives of people and you can't go with this one size fits all. People's lives are different. Their situations are different and constantly needing to bring in that level of change is really important to be able to cater to because we're dealing with lives and we're dealing with a life here in and that life is in your hands in some instances. Thirdly, I've also learned that though I, though we call ourselves Child Action Lanka and we want to focus 100% on working with children, and we do, the center of all that we do is about children, but it's hard to work with children and make sure that their lives are sustainable unless you're able to work with their moms as well. The reason I say I'm not trying to be gender biased in any way, but very often the dads are out there, they get drunk, they're in prison, and they're absent. And the moms are around a lot more than the fathers, I think. And so working with them enables us to create a certain level of sustainability. So whether it's helping them create an income, helping them cre- get a, a source of employment, helping them get some form of stability so that they don't leave their children and go away overseas for employment and leave the child to be abused, leave the child unprotected, uncared for. In that sense, I think we've had to change our focus in terms of not just working with the children, but also working with the moms as well at the same time. These days, what you said is very true. No one can really function by themselves. You really need other people to come along. And perhaps two heads are really better than one. The idea the kind of brainstorming, the kinds of ways they can manage and use resources. Yeah. That's and especially true. just now, you, when you mentioned your social media IT guy came and exactly. persistently told you about <laughs> the project that you need to do. Yes. Yeah, and sometimes you find these, you find the answers sometimes in the most unexpected places, isn't it? People have, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know whether it's there in another language but in our local language we say if you're inside a well you're like a frog inside a well and you can only see what's happening inside so it helps to sometimes have people look from the outside and maybe they're not part of your field they're not what to do but they might have inside that they can bring that and help you think through things that you never thought yourself sometimes and that contributes to the like we went at the beginning of our conversation to thinking outside the box yeah. So I think never underestimate those conversations and relationships. I want to come back to the topic of two things, actually, two interesting tracks that I want to go into. One is sustainability. You're talking about economic empowerment. And I also noticed there was a very interesting project on your website called RAP. Is that also related to how you're creating economic empowerment for the women? Yes, it, a lot of people know that Sri Lanka had a 30-year civil war between two ethnic races. And this project was also created with the idea of bringing peace into those ethnic groups and getting them to talk to each other. So the whole idea in developing that project at the beginning was to get people to... In Sri Lanka, we all wear saris. We had got all kinds of saris. They're very pretty, six meters of cloth that we wrap around our bodies. You get wedding saris, funeral saris, meeting saris, all the different types. And it was putting people, putting a call out there for people to donate their secondhand saris to us and that we could then upcycle them into other products. And we started out by creating bags by creating hair bands by creating makeup cases by creating cushions all kinds of things and the whole thing was to get people who are working in so a lot of our moms who are working in the south our moms who are in the north try getting them talking to each other 
by discussing designs, by putting them for training together so that they don't speak the same language, but also more than that, it's the differences in ethnicity. And because of the war, there's the war is finished, but there's a huge restraint in wanting to, I don't want to talk with the other group. These are the people who were into killing some of my family or this is how they died. And so getting them to then talk to each other because of this project was one of the key objectives we had. But as a result, to also then provide them with a source of income and to be able to provide the moms with by sewing these products that then we would help sell them and very often to an overseas market. It's, they've done so well with it, but for them in their rural communities, for them to be able to sell it is really hard. But when you bring it out into the city, when you bring it out into other countries, people go, wow, I'd really love to buy these products. So we've been able to help the women not only talk to each other from the different ethnic groups by sharing their material and designs and all that, but also when they create the products, then being able to sell it to an overseas market, sometimes to a city market for them and provide them with an income. And so we sell it at quite like fair trade income kind of thing. We do keep a small percentage, about 10% that we keep back for the organization to be able to help other women again. But the rest goes to these women as an income for them. So they're able to stay at home. They're able to make these things. Sometimes they will come to our centers because our centers have sewing machines as well and come and use the sewing machines there to make the products. But they will be able to sew and then sell it, earn an income to be able to put meals on the table for their children. So in that sense, then they don't need to always be depending on us for their meals. They don't have to. And as a woman, then they're able to also have their own little bit of income to do what they want to do. That's a really cra- clever idea. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Getting, getting people to talk to each other through sewing classes as well as talking about designs what you want to make with the sari yeah it's hard because what we did is brought in the saris that people donated from the north and gave it to the people in the south gave the products from the south to the north east to the west um, and the style of saris and the patterns and the colors are very different depending on where you're located and so that kind of forced them to have to then talk to each other because if not, they would never talk. Even it was the same with the kids. We brought, we had a cricket play, playing nation. We brought the kids in to play cricket and the kids in the north said, oh, we are not playing with the kids from Candy because they are the ones who killed our parents. And the kids from Candy in the middle of Sri Lanka, they said, oh, we don't want to play with these kids in the north or the east. They're all tigers, they're all terrorists, they're the ones who created all the bombs and lost the peace in the country and we don't want to have anything to do with them. And so we realized it didn't help to play intercity, but we mixed them all up. And at the end of it, they couldn't speak each other's language, but they were still hugging each other, they were eating off each other's plates, they were dancing together, they were partying together and... It was an amazing experience to see that. It brought a lot of tears into my eyes to see that it's these little things, whether it's sewing upcycling saris or whether it is playing a sport together, things like this that can break those barriers and walls that we create after a war. As well as to break down also the suspicion because people get very suspicious of each other. They don't know who the other party is. They have all these walls, invisible walls. That's right. That's so true. So through your projects and your programs, you're bringing unity. (laughs) Not just food and not just economic empowerment. I hope so. I hope so. We also do provide free education for children so that, you know, that the children have no excuse to not be able to pass an exam. So they come to your centre? Yes. So if they're not even academic in their inclination, we provide them with vocational training and other options in terms of helping them become employable so that they don't need to be begging on the streets or getting into all the kind of misses that their parents live in currently. So it's all about providing them with a second opportunity, a second chance to life, I think. We have talked about the organization. We have talked about the projects and the programs that you're doing. So now let's get into talking about Debbie. Yes. <laughs> so Debbie, I found out that you started off your career as a copywriter. 
That's right. I think you also studied something to do with business management. Yes. And what were your growing up years like? And where, which part of Sri Lanka do you grow up in? So I was born in Colombo, in the main city. And I grew up for part of my time in Colombo. And then my parents decided to move to the next second largest city in Sri Lanka called Kandy. And Kandy is more reserved a more reserved environment, I think. And I remember I was about 12 years old when we moved to Kandy. And I it took me a long time to figure out what on earth are we doing here? Life finishes here at 6 o'clock in the evening. Everybody goes home. There's nothing much to do. There's no beaches around. Everything cl- kind of shuts down. And I was like, okay, what do people do here? And I realized that after 8 o'clock, people had to watch news at 8 o'clock in the night. And then they basically go to sleep. And I was like, oh, okay. (laughs) So I think I got into that pattern of learning to sleep early then. And I used to go to sleep very early. But they also woke up really early. People woke up at 2.33 in the morning to start cooking for the day. And it is so early. (laughs) I thought you wanted to stay at 5.30 in the morning. (laughs) No, no. By 5.30, they'd already left home. They've gone. They're on their way to work. And they had to travel quite far to get to work. So people would travel really early. And so I became one of these people too. I'd wake up really early. And I think after a while, like now come move back to Colombo with my family and we've come back and settled down here. But that whole thing about waking up early still has become a habit to me. So I don't get to sleep as early as eight o'clock because in Colombo life still goes on. And very often by the time I get back from work, it's quite late. But I still do try to wake up really early. I've enjoyed and learned the value of waking up really early. So I wake up about three o'clock in the morning. I think I enjoy that time. I've got used to it. That's something that Candy taught me to own the day. And I love chasing the dawn. Wake up before the rest of the world wakes up. It's quiet. Helps me think. Helps me plan for the day. I've got nobody bothering me and there's no... But now I think with things like WhatsApp and all that, you still do get messages because people in other countries are awake. But I have the excuse of not having to reply them because they think we are asleep. (laughs) So I can have a very quiet morning and do my planning and focus and it gives me a little bit of space. So I think that's something I brought over from Candy to Colombo. And uh, yeah, so... I think on and off, I've had my spells where I've moved from Candy to Colombo, from Colombo to Candy. I've done that a few times. And when I finished schooling, I came to Colombo and I was working in advertising. I'm a very creative person in that sense. And I love doing creative writing. So I was actually the English copywriter. And I loved playing around with words and I love creating thoughts through words. And I really enjoyed that job. And I think it was a great experience. I got to meet a lot of interesting people. and But then I moved back to Kandy and realized that in Kandy, there were not many advertising agencies, mainly because all the head officers were in Colombo. So it made sense for agencies to be in Colombo. And Kandy, Kandy didn't have a lot of agencies like that. I think at that point, I don't know whether it does now, at that point there weren't any. And so that's where I got introduced into the development field and I got into an international organization that worked in development and that was my first experience to development and they actually said they selected me because I didn't have any NGO experience. So I went in completely raw with my business cap on. I think as a child I always wanted to have my own company and set up my own organization. So that's the reason I went into business management and administration. And I enjoy studying admin and I think I am a very admin kind of person, planning things out, organizing kind of my thing. So I think, yeah, that's what kind of drove me into studying business management and administration. And a lot of people often ask me, you set up an organization, an NGO, a charity, Have you studied social work? Have you studied development work? And my answer is no, I never did. But it's only now that I've got into studying social work and studying the impact and the importance of community development. And even then, I think it's because of the business experience I have 
that I've started thinking, how can I make this work more sustainable? How can I make it long lasting? How can it function without a constant NGO having to back it up? And so I've started studying sustainable community development as a result of it. So your business management experience did come into play. Definitely. Big time. Big time. Yeah, yeah. Even in the whole forefront of studying HR or marketing or finances, I would say it's played a huge role and I'm very grateful for those experiences. In your area of work, have you ever heard any myths that you like to debunk about the Mm. work that you do? Oh yeah, constantly. I think, especially when you're working with children, one of the things, I don't know whether it's a local one or whether it's a global one, but it's mostly because we work with little babies, right? We take them from the time they're tiny babies. Some of them are two weeks, three weeks old. And the common myth is don't spoil them by holding them too close. And if you hold, if you keep carrying them, they're going to only get used to it and they're going to become really demanding. So don't do those kind of things. That's not the way you take care of children. And my thing is, these are children who come with a huge lack in their life. They come with a huge need and we're trying to meet that emotional need for them as well. They need to be held. They need to be, they need to be cuddled. They need all that love as well. You're not spoiling them by doing that. You're providing them with that security by doing it. And I think that's a huge cultural issue that we've had. Something else has been about this must be something from their past life that they're paying for now and you need to let them go through it. And so because of that, the level of, I think people who want to come and support, they don't want to influence their past life and make things better for them now and provide a change for them because it would interfere with their karma. And I think, okay, if we can do anything to make life better for them, why not? Why not do that change? And often the other one, other myth is that kids on the street are not smart. They can't do it. They're just really dumb in a certain sense, if I may say that. I've seen the opposite. I've seen that if they were given an opportunity, an equal opportunity, just like we give our children, they can make life happen. Who said that just because they were born in the wrong place, that they couldn't think any more than our kids can? So, yeah. And then also another thing about, there's a lot of myths around that. I think think we could go on and on. I think about trusting people who you work with. Because I started out 16 years ago. At that point, I was quite young. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't as many grey hairs as now. And I got constantly told, when you're working in a team, you need to not trust people so much. You need to be a leader. You need to be tough. You don't need to wear your heart on your sleeve. You need to lead with authority and be really strict and tough about what you want. And I realized that that was not my style. I didn't want to change who I was just because of what I did. And so because of that, for me, I think it's always been very relationship-based and in an organization that has grown from two people on staff to now over 100 people on staff, I still maintain the fact that a child action uncle, your family, we're going to face this together. And if you have problems at home, I won't hear about them. It's not about don't leave your problems at the door. We're going to work here. That's not the style. I want to hear what's going on in your home. Because on the other hand, I know people take their work back home with them. And they're working from home as well. I know we've got a team that's extremely dedicated. They're working through the night sometimes, answering calls on emergencies that are going on. And so my thing is, we're family here. We're going to face this together. If you've got an issue, I want to know what's happening in your life. And being very relationship-based and I'm going to trust you and I want you to trust me. And if you've got an opinion, I want to hear your opinion as well. I'm not the leader here. I'm here to set a guideline or some direction but I want us to work together as a team. And those were like going against a lot of the principles that I was hearing and people saying, oh, she's just got too much of a big heart. She can't lead an organization. But I decided, look, this is my style and this is how I can do it. And it's worked. I think the more we trust people, they trust us in return. The more we know, they know that we are counting on them. They live up to that. They rise up to those responsibilities and expectations and so I've got an amazing team of people and I don't think 
a child actually and could be able to do all that we do if it was not for them because if i was going to lead and say i don't trust these people i just tell them what to do and i'm always double checking to see and if i had done that i don't think they'd be doing what they do so well just wonderful to know because i think a lot of times people think that in order to be in a position of leadership you need to be tough hmm. all the time true. true and and these days i also see there's a lot of that you need to have heart in the leadership that's right yeah i think that's missing sometimes and i think sometimes it calls for there are the times you have to make those tough decisions but then it's based on the trust that the team has in you if they trust you to be making the decision they will back you up on it and sometimes it might not be the right thing and sometimes you might make loads of mistakes but knowing that you got your team backing you on it makes all the difference and that comes from that relationship and being able to share your heart and for i think for your team to also not just see your strengths but to see your weaknesses as well and to know that you know when you're wrong that you're able to say you're wrong is really important for a leader and I also see that from the moment we spoke about the cup of milk project you're someone who really welcomes outside ideas yes. not just from the in our team or just the people you're working with so i think that really helps more idea idea generation yeah big time come to you making come I to you and, and say hey devi we've got this idea and if you're persistent enough perhaps devi will take it up <laughs> True, true, true. I I love it when people come up with ideas. I love listening to people's ideas. Sometimes they take forever to happen. Sometimes they may not even happen. But I love listening to ideas and seeing how. And that happens a lot because I find a lot of good support of people who are willing to show me things, to teach me things, to bring me new ideas, that, even from other countries that I can learn and bring them into our Sri Lankan system and create new things. And um, Yeah, I, I love it. What is the craziest thing you've ever done? Right. I think I'm a complete adrenaline junkie. I love things that like my adrenaline. Jumping off a plane at 35,000 feet. I think that was a reason. With a parachute? Me. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. <laughs> Where was that? That was in Australia. People think I was, I was completely mad, and my friend who took me, uh, she said, "Okay, I'm going to be here to hold your bags, but you can go and do it." And she was very supportive. She took me there early morning to do it. At the end of it, once I landed on ground and everything, she said, "Do you know that somebody I knew actually did that and died last month?" I was like, "Right." <laughs> That's good to know after after you jumped successfully. I know. I know. <laughs> But yeah, I love doing crazy things like that. So, is that also something that you're no longer afraid of jumping out of planes? Hmm, no, I actually enjoyed it. I think I would do it all over again if I got a chance to. I love doing things like that, things like roller coasters and yeah, it's totally my kind of thing. So, I like doing I, crazy I things. I wouldn't have thought that would have come up from you, Debbie. <laughs> <Jamie. laughs> I know. <laughs> You're like, wow, different. <laughs> When it comes to doing crazy things. Uh, What about someone who has had a tremendous impact on you? I would say someone who's had a tremendous impact is probably my parents in my upbringing. And I I know a lot of people would say, "Oh, yeah, it's my parents and all that." But for me, I think just because they lived that kind of life of constantly giving out We used to have growing up, and I know it goes against all the health and safety regulations and child protection regulations. But we used to always have people staying in our house, and I had no idea who these people were and why they were staying. But we would have complete strangers. Well, they were strangers to us as kids. We didn't know what was going on in their situations and all that. But random people coming and staying at our house and it would be suddenly we have this older sister younger sister staying in our house because in our culture everyone's like a sister or a brother so we had all these random people staying and i would see my parents spending hours with them and they would be crying and they be having some situation that we didn't know anything about for me it was just a good opportunity to find a new playmate when i was bored 
are used their time to <laughs> play a game or whatever. But they constantly live the sacrificial life of now I understand that they've actually rescue, rescuing girls who had loads of issues and had nowhere to go to that they would bring them and they would stay in a house and my parents would work with them and constantly be counseling them, guiding them. And I I think that's where it all stemmed out from learning to as a person, a citizen, I think learning to give back. And my parents they constantly gave and I grew up in a very middle class kind of family so we didn't have like heaps of luxuries or anything like that but the little that we had my parents were constantly giving and I think if they could have given my brother and I away also they would have done it but they did give everything away all the time and I think that's where I think growing up in that environment that really yeah helped me learn all that no wonder you started child action Lanka <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think in fact, must have rubbed up on you really well. <laughs> Probably. Now that I look at it, yes. At that time, I never realized it. Do you have an, any unusual habits besides waking up at 3 a.m.? <laughs> <laughs> Which in itself is quite unusual, yes. I think I'm a list person. So I like to write out everything and I constantly carry a little book and a pen with me wherever I go and in this day of technology yeah we have notes and we have you can send a note to yourself or a message to yourself but it doesn't beat a book and a paper a pen I love writing things and I'm constantly writing even if I met you I'll be writing what you say I'll be having a little notebook writing things down and my uncle used to always say oh my goodness one day when she dies we're going to have to bury her with books and paper and <laughs> She's going to need this because I'm always writing and I love the whole technology and emails and all that, but it doesn't beat that feeling of writing. So I love writing. I'm with you on that. I always have pen and paper in every room in my house. (laughs) Just for those moments, suddenly when I think of something in my own way, I think it's brilliant. And I think, yeah, I need to write it down before I forget it, right? So exactly. that's where the pen and paper and notepads all exist in every corner of the house. Oh, so that's really, yeah. good. <laughs> that's really good. <laughs> and what personal goal are you most focused on? I think personally, I want to be a better version of myself, constantly improving who I was. I think that's my only competitor, my yesterday self to my today self. And if I can be a better version of myself. So... I focus a lot on education myself. I, My family calls me an eternal student because ever since I entered preschool at the age of four, and now I'm 43, I've never stopped studying. I've constantly been studying for something or the other. And I'm always looking at what am I going to do next? And at one point, I can remember I was doing a bachelor's, I was doing a master's and a PhD all at the same time. (laughs) Somebody was like, you have to stop. (laughs) How do you manage those three things at the same time? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's a bit crazy. But I think that whole pressure of meeting deadlines constantly feeds into that living on the edge and living on adrenaline and having that pressure constantly and I think I would miss it if I didn't have it and people think that's a bit weird but I love it (laughs) so in terms of personal goals I think educating myself learning is one of those big personal goals I have for myself I really enjoyed our conversation today because it's not just about the organization that you're running but also an in-depth look at yourself who you are and now I know where that motivation to start child action came from. (laughs) What's that one key thing that you want our listeners, the person who's listening to this right now, to really take to heart? I think one of the key things is to give children a second chance. Just because they are born in situations that are not ideal, it doesn't mean that we can give up on them. Every child deserves a second chance. And in whatever capacity, maybe you're in a business, maybe you've got your own personal issues and your own problems out there. But just take the time to, in some way or the other, to join hands in giving children a second chance. Because that second chance can 
completely transform their lives and it's all about transforming the lives of children and wherever you are in the world i'd say give give a second chance to a child and it will make a huge difference to them well said debbie i love your takeaway message and finally where can people find you if they want to learn more about you or to support your work or your programs yeah so please look us up on www. childactionlanka.org we are very active on our website we also got child action lanka on instagram on facebook on linkedin or you can always reach out to me at childactionlanka@slt.net.lk drop an email and you will get an, a reply eventually it might not be the next in the next 5 minutes but you will get a reply eventually so please do feel free to reach out Thank you Debbie it was a very good interview and I really am thankful that someone somewhere in Sri Lanka is doing something really amazing for the kids there especially the kids who need the most help Thanks so much Krista thanks so much for this opportunity of helping me get this message out there to others I think what you're doing is absolutely amazing in creating this platform and opportunity for women out there to be able to share their message. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Debbie. We will see you again for sure. Sure, I look forward to that. Whether it is a business or non-profit organization, it's always about people. The people you serve, the people who work with you, the people you lead. Debbie's story is one of tenacity and courage despite the challenges of her work and the situation in her country. When I heard about her, I was interested to speak to her. I always have pre-interview calls with my podcast guests because I want to know her as a person first and foremost. I immediately liked her as we chatted about her work and her life. She was down to earth, refreshingly honest and open, and I remember she said that she wasn't going to leave Sri Lanka not when the children needed her now more than ever. I hope you are as inspired as I am by Debbie and her love for the children around her. As Debbie shared her favorite quote It doesn't take a lot to offer kindness. What kindness can you offer to the people around you today? If you've enjoyed today's episode, why not share this episode with a friend or rate, review and subscribe on Spotify or just visit womenprinterasia.com. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I appreciate you and I will see you next Friday.